I presume you're here in order to learn of Magecraft. I'll have you know, there's no room for the weak-willed in this course. And despite your best efforts, the sorcery of our time is but a fraction of what it once was in the Age of Gods. Much of the craft is established through pedigree, and the culture of mages is riddled with deception and moral depravity. That said, if you insist, I shall do my best to educate you in this miserable, yet fascinating world. In our previous lesson, I covered the unique witchcraft of Alice Kuonji, that being Ploy Kickshaw. It's not something you see every day, even when mages are concerned. Following in that vein, I'd like to cover another form of magecraft we might consider exclusive or uncommon. Thus, today's lesson is dedicated to Ainsworth magecraft, including their use of class cards. The Ainsworth are a family of unaffiliated magi who live in the Fuyuki city of a separate parallel world. By now, hearing of such outrageous concepts should be normal. What we know of Fuyuki in our world does not necessarily apply to others. For the Ainsworths, however, they've been a famous part of their world for over 1,000 years. One would not be off base to consider them their world's equivalent of the Ainsburns. They even create their equivalent of homunculi, in this case, dolls. We'll come back to that, though. Much like the Ainsburns, the Ainsworths had a grandiose aspiration they could only solve with the Holy Grail. In their own way, they sought a means of saving humanity, and worked to develop the Holy Grail alongside two other mage families, one of them being their world's version of the mottos. This begs the question, what did humanity need to be saved from? Well, even though mana depletion is something almost all worlds struggle with, the Ainsworth family had to contend with a more rapid decline they called degradation. Its effects could be seen through severe weather abnormalities, Japan, for instance, would have snowy summers. This rapid climate change killed off most plant life, killing off the animals that grazed upon them. The humans of this world are no exception. Earth has developed dry spots, where all mana has been completely depleted, and in those spots can be found mysterious particles that are poisonous to humans. It is as if said particles are wiping the planet clean for a new age. Within no more than ten generations, all humans are expected to perish. Science has certainly helped slow this process, but it alone is insufficient. Hoping to avoid this fate, the Ainsworths believe the Holy Grail can be used to make humanity compatible with the particles. If you recall my lesson on Ultimate Ones, this may feel very reminiscent of beings such as A-rays and liners. The Einsburn family from our world constructed the Greater Grail as a massive spell. It came about from having Einsburn homunculi merged with a complex spell located inside the Ten no Sakazuki. The Ainsworth family uses these very same caverns, or their version of them anyway, to construct a similar spell. At its core, however, is not a homunculus, but an unfortunate girl from the Sakatsuki, an ancient and gifted family. Sakatsuki children were revered as children of God, possessing divine authority until age six. Such divinity was so strong that Sakatsuki children could grant wishes, much like the stored mana in a lesser grail. As such, the Ainsworth used these children as the core component of their holy grail. As wishmakers from birth, the Sakatsuki could be used to gather mana from a completed grail to wish for the Ainsworth ambition to become reality. Despite this, the first three Ainsworth Holy Grail Wars mysteriously ended in failure. During the fourth Holy Grail War, the Ainsworth head, Darius, unleashed a black shadow upon Fuyuki, destroying much of the city and its people. This shadow consumed all members of the Sakatsuki family, except for one child named Miyu. She responded to the people's cries and granted their wishes by quelling the darkness. In the aftermath, Miyu was taken under the care of Kiritsugu Emiya, who also hoped to use her power to save the world. His son Shiro, however, refused to treat Miyu as a tool, allowing her to grow up to the age of ten. In theory, Miyu should have lost her power as a child of God, but with the right ritual, these powers can still be triggered. 
Thus, the Ainsworth family, continuing under its heir, Julian, kidnapped Miu to use as the Greater Grail for a fifth Holy Grail war. Shiro would not let this slide, and participated in the war to save her. He successfully defeated all other masters, and used his wish to make Miu happy. Miu, in turn, wished to become his real sibling. To avoid the Ainsworth's pursuit, Miu was sent to another world, but this escape only delayed the inevitable and allowed the Ainsworth's class card system to function in that other world. Thus, Julian pursues Miu, hoping to convince her to grant his wish at the cost of her life. It's worth noting that, while the Ainsworth openly declare the Grail Wars an attempt to save humanity from degradation, they have actually been manipulated by their former leader Darius into pursuing a somewhat different goal. In his youth a thousand years prior, Darius studied alchemy and came upon the discovery of Pandora, a doll of mud birthed by the Greek Olympians to preside over Pandora's box. The box, an ominous black cube, contains despair and misfortune, a manifestation of Earth's failed possibilities. After the box endured long after the Age of Gods came to an end, however, it began to develop possibilities beyond anything human history could fathom. Sadly, during that time, Pandora had lost the ability to open the box herself, and until it opens, she is unable to die. Darius sympathizes with Pandora, who is killed and tormented whenever people discover she isn't human. He wanted to help her be free from immortality, and by opening the box, he believed his dying world would be reborn as a new possibility that not even the Root could oversee. In that endeavor, Darius uses a special form of displacement magecraft. Also known as Flash Air, displacement is a family of spells that transform or otherwise shapeshift matter. Its foundation lies within alchemy and the idea of turning one thing into another from water into wine, or a spoon into a fork, for instance. Darius' displacement works in a broader sense, allowing him to displace his own soul and survive for thousands of years by appearing within his descendants. We've seen cases like this before, such as Zoken Mato, but it inevitably involves the soul in question degrading over time. Darius stores his soul within Pandora's box itself, and since the world contained within transcends the rules of our world, he has avoided the problem of his soul's corruption. The same magecraft is used to an impressive extent, as Darius changes the shape and size of Pandora's box at will. His original body has long since perished, but whenever necessary, he can take control of his descendants, and currently uses Julian as his host. Pandora also goes by many names and takes various forms over the years, with her current being a little girl named Erica. This craft extends into the Ainsworth's use of dolls. Like automata, or puppets, dolls are artificial humanoid forms. Using displacement, Darius can transfer other people's souls into these doll bodies as a form of life extension. Many of the current Ainsworth family members are in fact dolls, hosting previous members that have otherwise perished. These dolls are not perfectly crafted, however, and so irregularities emerge from each of them. For example, Angelica lacks the majority of her former emotions. Often, she can only imitate human feelings. Beatrice Flowerchild, on the other hand, can no longer remember her childhood and is irrationally obsessed with her love for Julian. These mental deficiencies or obsessions are quite common for Ainsworth dolls. Darius himself suffers from a similar imperfection, in that every time he displaces himself, he loses sight of why he wanted to open Pandora's box in the first place. It seems the Ainsworth goal of saving their dying world is no longer as noble as it once was, justifying Miu and her friends when they decide to oppose it. Even Julian, who was being manipulated by his elder, doesn't necessarily want to open Pandora's box. While Pandora desperately wishes to die, he wishes for her to find genuine happiness. He refuses to let her die in a state of despair. Julian believes opening Pandora's box will only shower their world in corrupt mud. Pandora couldn't possibly rest assured with the world in that state, so his aim is to both open and destroy the box, letting her finally die with hope for the future. He makes an attempt to obliterate Pandora's box, and it nearly costs him his life, and from his remains, Darius fully reincarnates. The mud that pours from the box doesn't concern Darius. 
He only wants to witness the birth of a new world from inside of it. Thus, to protect the people of his world, it appears Darius must be defeated. The methods through which Miu, her allies, and the Ainsworths fight are the class cards. Why bother summoning a heroic spirit when you can become one? This is the fundamental thought process behind class cards, though of course it's never quite that simple. As you know, heroic spirits are manifestations of heroes long deceased. When summoned, they share the same ego they were known for, allowing for masters and servants to feud or otherwise disagree. Class cards allow a master to use a hero's power without having to confront their will. These cards are created by first passing heroic spirits through Pandora's box, suppressing their egos, and storing their abilities within cards that can be invoked in various ways. Most commonly, class cards are used to temporarily manifest a servant's noble phantasm through a command called Include, Limit, Expand. This can be performed by multiple users multiple times through the command Parallel Include. More powerful, however, is Install, Phantom Summon, a command that lets the user install a card directly into their body. This not only gives a master access to a servant's noble phantasm, but also their appearance and skills. In another sense, it is as though the user is being overwritten by the servant they install, merging the two of them into one. Because class cards are physical objects, they can be lost or left on the ground. When unattended, these cards can absorb mana from their surroundings, and with enough, they occasionally manifest the spirit inside in a blackened state. Such servants possess no reason, and only fight on instinct within a mirror world generated around them. This means that civilians are generally safe from blackened servants, and only mages hoping to retrieve the cards have to encounter them. There's an interesting dynamic regarding class cards and their strength. Suppressing a servant's ego is possible, but not inherently ideal. When their weapons and skills are used without consent, they are far weaker than if the servant and master are of like mind. Shiro, for instance, when installing the card for heroic spirit Emiya, is especially powerful. Darius is not a mage who can be defeated so easily, however. With his displacement, he can grasp and remove glass cards from people even when they're installed. Having full control of his host, he demonstrates monstrous strength that no other Ainsworth mage could hope to achieve in a single lifetime. Quite uniquely, as a being living for thousands of years, he takes advantage of that history to embellish himself as a legendary figure. Using Mew's blood, Darius carves his life onto large tablets, chronicling himself with the hope of ascending beyond his human form. In creating his own story, he defies the Akashic records stored within the root, exploring entirely new possibilities to discover unknown heroic spirits. Their noble phantasms are so rare that not even King Gilgamesh is aware of them, when he should otherwise have the prototypes of all legendary weapons. When we consider that divergent worlds are often pruned or reach some form of inevitable destruction, it's hard to say that Darius' plan is ill-conceived. By allowing his own world to drown in mud, he can birth an entirely new history, one that he hopes will exceed the current history. This becomes an issue that surpasses what is considered right or wrong. At the very least, the planet itself is weary, sending a manifestation of Gaia's lingering will in the form of Tanaka, an absent-minded teenager with a resilient body. She most certainly plans to continue opposing Darius by placing her hopes on Ilya, and I can't exactly fault her for that either. Regardless, I find it fascinating how the Ainsworth family's magecraft is built upon harnessing Pandora's power. Darius is quite formidable, with ambition rivaling that of mages striving to reach the root. In summation, Ainsworth magecraft isn't exactly something the family can call its own. The family legacy began with Darius discovering Pandora and catering his existing displacement spells toward exploiting Pandora's box. He uses the box to preserve his soul as he inhabits the bodies of his descendants. This same displacement is used to create dolls, artificial bodies bound to human souls. Pandora's box also plays a key role in creating class cards, robbing heroic spirits of their will for the sake of their masters. With it, Darius aims to defy the very root itself to create a world never before experienced. This makes me want to reflect on how mages, despite generally sharing the goal of reaching the root and gaining true magic, can differ quite a lot in terms of ambition and circumstance. 
Thus, for our next lesson, I wish to discuss the motivations of various mages. Perhaps, by doing so, you may be able to affirm or even challenge your own reasons for studying the craft. Before I go ahead and roll the credits, I want to give a special shout out to all my $10 and up supporters. VideoGamer75, Steven Elak, Samuel Gersten, Otaku Mom, Jens Bauman, Mystic Samurai1983, Freebrick, RNG or Shuffles1498, Alexis Yukio Gomez Yamato, Johnny Tsunami, Link Pendrago, Brickin, Caitlin P, Vladimir Rovna, Succubus Sakura, and SF Giants fan Mike. Thank you all so much. Thanks for watching! If you enjoy this channel, help us grow by liking, commenting, sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all of our anime discussion, lore, or Let's Play content. You can support us directly through Patreon, Subscribestar, or our YouTube membership, all of which come with benefits like exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate, celebrate your, your fandom! fandom.